the name of the class is Aggressive Command Leads to Successful Outcomes. And I'm a true believer in that. I think a lot of times young firefighters, they're ready to go. Captains, they're, the new officers, they're ready to go. And the problem lies in the chief level. When you put the rings on them and you pull them back, it's when things go downhill. And I'm a firm believer that if you have aggressive firefighters, you have aggressive tactics, you have aggressive safety features built in, the one thing we're lacking is always aggressive command. The reason I put this fire up here, this is, this is our Super Bowl Sunday. This is what we want. If you're a fireman, you want to make this fire. This was a very bad fire, and we were just talking. I wish I'd had a picture later on. This fire even turns worse. We all know what's going to happen with that smoke. It's just a matter of time. So it goes to the first floor, first floor, second floor. And if you can barely see some guys going up the ladder, VES going up. We had confirmed people trapped. It, ended, it got so bad that I put a deck gun in these two windows, and I put lines in these two windows with people above it. And you would have thought I'd set the fire on some of the questions I got. Why would you do that? Why would you put guys above that? Why would you do this? Why would you put lines in below them? Well, because we had kids trapped. And sometimes that's the aggressiveness and the decision making that we have to do. And I'm a firm believer, and I know it touches on some people's toes, but I, I don't do survivability profiles. I just don't think that's our job. The one thing I know 100% for sure when we do survivability profiles and we don't go in, their survivable rate is zero. If we stand outside and we look at all of these reasons not to go in, we're putting ourselves first and we're putting them in harm's way. And along with that, and we're going to talk about it shortly, I think we have to be smart. I think we have to be aggressively smart. And that's some words from uh, Captain Clifford Reed, and we'll talk about later. You have to be aggressively smart. And by being aggressively smart, you build safety features into everything you do. Everything has a reason, everything has a practice procedure, and everything has a backup to it. You have a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D. So you ask yourself, what is aggressive command? If you think about that, you know, what is the answer? The answer is what I just tried to relay is that we do things that's unorthodox, or we do things that we know will work, or we do things that we planned on and practiced on to get there. The one thing it's not, and I like to make sure that people understand it's not recklessness. We don't do it without a plan. We don't just go bailing off in there without procedures. We have to have plans, an aggressive command. It starts at the top, and it goes down to that bottom firefighter. And I think, and if there's any more chiefs in the room, you can, you can think this yourself. We are the weak link in when this usually happens. Civilian deaths, we've talked about this earlier today. There's, there's an average between 3,000 and 3,500 annually. You can see that 70% of them are attempting to escape. That's why we got to get lines in between the fire and the means of egress. Just like we learned when we're in fire school, they know their homes. When we make EMS runs, when we make these service calls, we got to make. So I want to tell you a story in my territory that I spent a majority of my career. There was a um, plumbing shop, and above the plumbing shop, there was like a little jute joint, and it had little rooms for people whenever they had customers, and they had a pool table there. And you could not get out the back door because there was a tree growing at the back door. So I'm working on the southwest side of town. I hear that address. I call a friend of mine and I said, be careful, you can't get out the back door. There's a lot of weight up there. And I said, you have a plug across the street. You get it. He goes, how would you know that? And leave me alone, I'm going to a fire. After the fire was over, he called me, and he goes, how in the world did you know that? Because we made runs there, we planned it, and we always had a plan that if this catches on fire, it's a death trap, and this is what we're going to do. That's aggressive command. Most fatal fires happen when people are sleeping. And this is the big one that I think a lot of times we get away from, is asphyxiation. People are not burning up in houses. 
They're not breathing in houses. So if we're resetting the fire, if we're standing outside, not going in, we're not doing anything for that asphyxiation. We might control the fire a little bit, but we're not doing the one thing that those civilians need, and that's to get them out. And someone talked about this earlier in the day, and I agree with this 100%. We hear about firefighter fatalities, and believe me, every fatality we have, I don't care what it's from, is still sad. But we are not killing firefighters in burning buildings. We're having heart attacks. We're getting killed in tankers. We're having cancer issues. Right here in the search, you can see that one firefighter had died in 2017 of asphyxiation. And we had one fell from a roof. We're getting a bad rap on VES now. And you guys, I, I guess you've seen it on social media. They're giving them a hard time. The last known fatality on VES was in the 40s. And I think that was in England even. We have to do these things. So there was some research done, and it was published in Fire Rescue One. It said that the top reasons of line of duty deaths are lack of SOGs, leadership, preparedness, appropriate decision making, and the last is personal responsibility. And I think we've touched on every one of these sometime today. SOPs, how can we, how can we fix that? A lot of times you have to do that at the company level or the district level. Now, the fire department may not agree with you on some of the things that you're changing and some things you're doing, but what you do is you get buy-in from your crews. And how you get buy-in, and we spoke about this last night, the chief and the captain gets out of their room, they get involved, they know what's going on, and you develop these procedures. That's how you fix the SOPs. Leadership, you got to let those young guys be leaders too. You've got to plan on and you've got to rely on that senior man that has been there and has done it. Just because I took a test doesn't make me the leader. You've got to jump on who is the best for that. And each individual one of us have strong points and we've got to rely on it. Preparedness, it goes back to training. We've talked about this all day today. I think everybody in here is pro-training, pro-development. That's the key to our success. Appropriate decision making. So you saw a few months ago when there was a rookie trying to open up a door, kind of caught himself on fire, Station 25. I'll tell you right now, I will take that guy today because if that kid is burning up like that to get in that door, just to get in the door, imagine what he's going to do if you're trapped in there. So we've got to make appropriate decision making. I would have probably had a line there, but I promise you I'd take that kid. We got to know when to cut holes. We got to know where to cut holes. I'm pro ventilation. A lot of times we get away from ventilation. I think, and we're going to talk a little bit about it in a second. <clears throat> We've got to make appropriate decisions. Do we set up a fan or do we cut up a hole? If we don't cut a hole, what kind of ventilation are we going to do? That becomes with the appropriate decision making. And then personal responsibility. The brother from Oklahoma just said it. We've got to look at ourselves. If we answer ourselves, it's our own responsibility if we move. So how do we become aggressive? We become aggressive by getting out, training, having a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, and you know it. When that fire truck goes on scene, you already have that plan in effect. So all that officer does when he comes up, or that chief, he just starts watching them and making sure they're safe. I don't have to stand there and be an orchestra and say, hey, I need you to pull an inch and three quarter. Hey, I need you to cut this. They know what they need to do. They get it, and chiefs, who are the chiefs? Are there chiefs in the room? I think we need to get out of our cars. When we sit down the street and we're not involved, that brings danger to us. If I'm standing in the front yard, let me back up just a second. I think there's two important types of command. There's strategical command, and that's going to be in your writs, it's going to be your high rises, that's going to be in your big multiple alarms. You need to kind of step back and get away where you can concentrate. Other than that, I think you need to be in a tactical command where you're in the front yard and you know what's going on. If you're there and that's your main responsibility, 
And I'll tell you three things I, I look at when I'm in the front yard. But if that's your sole responsibility, the guys doing the work, they don't have to concentrate on that. So three things that I'm going to look at at every single fire. The roof, the color of the smoke, and I'm going to see if that line's moving. If the line's not moving, why? If they're in there working and the smoke's getting darker, darker, and darker, why? Or if that roof starts sagging, I'm afraid it's going to fall on them. And it's easier for me to do as an officer because I'm not humping holes. I'm not cutting holes. And I can take back, and I can see the big picture, whereas the guy is concentrating on that. That's how we become aggressive. And I think as the officers in here, the captains in here, I think you'll agree that if you're inside and you know that I'm watching those three things for you, it's going to allow you to be a little bit more aggressive. And you don't have to worry about what's behind you because I'm doing that. And then you, you concentrate on looking at the firefighters. So this big chain puts us all on the same page. And that same page equals success for the civilians. That's how we become aggressive. So I'll let you watch this. And then we're going to talk about backup lines. I'm pro backup line. So you can see that the crews, they come in. This is a two-story. They both went up the stairs. The captain notices that the fire's burning behind him. He's trying to get a backup line. He gets their attention, and they put it out. They almost got in a pickle. So here's what I think are the benefits of a backup line. The first line goes, and the first line always gets between the fire and possible victims. That second line backs them up. And if they're in the kitchen, I'm not going to be up on them. I'm going to be this distance. And me as a captain, I'm going to walk up and say, I got your backup line. The truck comes in to do a search. The backup line backs off of that pumper a little bit. And so now he's here. He can protect the pumper here. He can protect the truck company while they're doing a search here. If it lights up on him or if anything happens, he's right there with a the line. And I think, and you guys can email me or call me, and I will talk, talk to you about this. We've trained on this for years and years, and it seems to work. If the chief ever says go defensive or back out, we never argue with them. You know these guys, and some of you old guys that's been around, give me two seconds and I got it. If you give me a minute, chief, I got it. Am I right? Every one of us has done it. But if the chief says back out immediately, that backup line goes on and it goes straight to the ceiling and it starts sweeping the entire room. All that's doing is cooling everything down it's keeping the fire from coming that way. The guys on the initial attack line shuts the nozzle off. They crawl out the line, leaving it in place. They get out. All the support people on the outside go to the street. The captain, and we're lucky. We have a captain and two guys on there. They get to the door. They get out of the way. The truck crawls around, tries to get out. The captain on the backup line is watching for the truck. And the reason we leave the line in place when that first pumper crew comes out, in case the truck gets lost, they can find their way out. So they find a line or they get to where the backup crew is. We get them out by the door. And then the backup team, they are sweeping the ceiling as they're coming out. They come out with their line. And the reason we do that in case it lights up on us or something like that. The reason we get everybody out to the street and we have a tack line, a backup line, and a truck crew right by the front door, you can get a par immediately. I got a par, I got a par, that quick, and then you can go back to work. So that's key, and it was, they found that that works. And that was a good example when you, when you would need a backup line. You saw both of those companies went up. So here you ask yourself, do I vent or do I search? And I bet you if we took every single one of us in this room, we'd probably have 30 different answers. But I'll tell you what works for Mo. And I tell you, I learned it from John Miller. John Miller's at District 19. District 19 got dispatched to a house just like this. The pumper crew was out. They were first in on the truck with confirmed kids trap. He went to the roof and cut a hole. Now, we hear all this about vent, that you do a coordinated to this. and coordinate. Well, he decided to go to the roof and cut a hole. The smoke lifted. 
When the smoke lifted, they pulled all the kids out and they all lived. So I start picking his brain. Why did you decide to cut instead of search? So his thought is, which makes a lot of sense to me, <clears throat> if you got smoke coming out like this and you don't have any visible flames, potentially by going through a door or going through a window, you can feed that oxygen we were just talking about and you can make it light up. But if you go to the roof and you cut that, it goes naturally up, and it lifts up off of them. But I guarantee you, every one of us have a different reason. And you, some people say, I would search, I would vent, and that's just going to have to be a call you make. I think, after studying it and talking to him, that maybe cutting a hole in a roof on something like that's best. That's aggressive. Here they actually have a hose line, so they're a little bit better off. But if you're in a truck company, that might be. We don't have water on our trucks. So we're, we're limited, limited to that. So it's, it's, it's only searching without a hose line or we do ventilation or we move burglar bars and things like that. So this is a good one. And I'll let you watch it. I won't talk much on it. But there's actually a crew up there, Captain Ricky Baker, Senior Captain Ricky Baker, and his crew's up there cutting a hole. I don't think anybody could survive in this the way it is right now. The pumper crew can't get down the hallway. They're trying to go through the front door over here. You can see that there's a lot of pressure under this right here. And they're thinking was if they could cut it right there, they're going to lift off. So they got, a, they got a ladder on this side. They're getting ready to put up a second ladder. They got two on the other side in case of emergency happens, they can get off. They got a hose crew trying to go through the front door. And this is in real time. And they're starting to get the hole. And as they're moving that hole, you can see what happens. And I would feel comfortable when you get back to him, saying that we could probably live in that right there, right now. That's an aggressive tactic, and that aggressive tactics had several features built into where they could do that. Multiple ladders to get off, crews going in to put the fire out, and something else I'll say about him, he's retired now, but it's impressive. You will see Captain Baker is the last guy to come off the roof. He'll turn around, look, make sure everything's going okay, and that's him right there. And he'll come down and make sure his guy's okay. And that pumper crew could walk through there, I think, and put the fire out. That's what it is. But you have to have a chief, or if you're if you're commanding officer on scene, you have to cut the reins off. You have to let the guys work in order to make this stuff happen. So this is me when I was on a rescue truck. And uh, I kind of like it. A little bit squirrely why I like it. But I was dirty. I never, ever took advantage of a young guy when I was a captain or as I'm a chief. I will carry my own bottle. I'll wear my own gear. And I will be as dirty as they are. And I will be the happiest guy on the fire ground. And that's the, what leaders are supposed to be. Train your crews. We've all said that in here today. That's, that's the key to success. You got to lead from the front. When I was a captain, I always stepped through the door the, before anyone else. I was the first one to go in. I swept it with a thermal imager. I wasn't stingy with a thermal imager like a lot of people are. I'd show that first lineman, let him look where the fire was at, and then we'd, we'd both go. I always lead from the front. Don't micromanage, and that's a big one for chiefs. Cut the reins off. They know what to do. You tell that crew to come in and make an offensive attack. You tell that truck to cut a hole. It stops at that. Let those guys work. If you start micromanaging them, you start slowing them down. Support your crew, and that's a big one. And I think everybody in here is kind of, kind of met on that, man. We're, we support the guys who need our support. It's a lot easier for the officers to go raise Cain than it is a firefighter. You, as a good leader, protect that young guy because guess what? You're grooming him to be that when you're gone. Demand district buy-in, and I know that's hard, and it's hard for everyone, but what happens is when you start getting district buy-in, when you set the standards here, you know, the city may, may have standards here, we set our standards right here in the district and we train up these standards and we live up to these standards, including everybody. The youngest guy at the station to the oldest guy to the station to every officer, including myself. 
I will never ask a guy to go out and train or stand in the rain if I don't. I will never ask a guy to wear his gear to fire unless I do. So what happens is you start getting that buy-in. And when you get that buy-in, guys start owning it. And when guys start owning it, it makes it personal. And I stole that from a Navy SEAL who wrote Extreme Ownership. When we own something, it makes, it makes it easier and better to push it. And we always lead to win. None of us. None of us like to lose. That's our personality. I bet if we took a poll, everybody in here was an athlete. We win. And that's the mentality we've got to have, especially as officers. And sadly as it is, and there's a lot of debate going on, some people just can't cut it, and they have to go. I don't want anybody to lose a job. Or I don't want anybody to have to transfer. But we have to take care of the citizens, and that comes with this buy-in and leading to win. Aggressive incident commanders, you don't hold your crew back. You give them an order and you let them go. You stay off the radio. I was talking to someone last night about radio communication. He said they barely ever talk on the radio. That's key to success because if somebody's trapped, if somebody's lost, they need to have that radio to get out. If we're just talking, we're taking away from emergency that they may have. Have you guys heard of classical naturalistic commanders? So the classical commander is the guy who has never been in a fire. The guy's never done anything, but he's smart. He's brilliant. He passes all the tests, and all of a sudden he's in charge. Well, he's got a clipboard with a checkoff sheet on it. So he's hitting all the checks. Well, okay, well, I said this on the radio. I said this on the radio. I got this coming. He stops watching that roof. Then you got that old guy that's been around, and he's seen everything. So he's like, all right, I've done this before. He's got a little Rolodex build up. And then that Rolodex, he pulls back what he's had. He goes, oh, I've seen this before, and this worked. Or this is not working. Let me do something different. So the naturalistic leaders are the guys who's earned their way and walked their way up the ranks. This is departmental specific. So if this is against your departmental policies, just take it out. But I'm not a big fan of engine and ladders assuming command and staying out in the front yard why they're going. There's too much work to be done. And you know, this morning when we held our breath and we counted that, that, that short length of time, if that engine goes on location, says I'm assuming command, and he stands out there and waits for the second in, engine to get in, that's just a delayed response for those people to get in and get in that. Remember, it goes back to the asphyxiation we talked about earlier. Um, again, that's departmental specific. Don't get yourself in trouble because of Mo Davis. But, you know, it's the last thing we need. <laughs> I get enough hate mail. But uh, same way with a the ladder. There's a lot of stuff to do. And when we as officers back off, it pulls the rings on the firefighters, and that's where the work's getting done. So you guys ever heard this? There's a Greek philosopher who came up with this, but it's so good for the fire service. And I wish that every one of us could do this. We'd so be so better off. So it says, out of every 100 men, 10 shouldn't even be there. 80 are just good targets. Nine are real firefighters. And we're lucky to have that one because that one will make the battle and he'll make them a warrior and he'll bring all the others home. There's a lot of truth to that. You always got that one guy, one guy, in your station, you're like, that guy's a leader. That guy's a warrior. That guy I can depend on. And I would think, but just knowing you guys for a couple days, it's probably you. Probably you. Why else would we be here on a Friday if you're not that one that's better than yourself? Anyway, that's all I have. Uh, you guys be aggressive. Be smart. Be aggressively smart. Those are the words of Clifford Reed, the guy that made the Reed Hood. I guess you guys have heard that. He's still active. He still comes around, talks to young guys, and he always leaves a conversation by telling young guys that. So thank you guys so much. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have too.